Greetings, Coffee, Health, and Science podcast listeners. Jordan River here with another episode. Today's guest is Bram from down in Costa Rica. He's here to talk to us about his little mini coffee plantation, about coffee trading, and so much more. A little fair warning in the beginning here. The quality of the sound is a little bit lower than we're used to here on the Coffee, Health, and Science podcast. Usually the show sounds so good and so smooth, but the connection was a little bit choppy, you know, coming from Central America. Still a wonderful listen, just fair warning for those who might be tuning in for the first time. So I appreciate you all. Without further ado, thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Hello, podcast listeners. You are now listening to the Coffee, Health, and Science podcast. I'm your host, Jordan River, and I want to thank you for tuning in today. Before we get started, please share the Coffee, Health, and Science podcast. Spread the show. Make sure you're subscribed. Give us a good rating and review. We appreciate it, everybody. The Coffee, Health, and Science podcast. What a unique project. I'm loving it. And I appreciate every one of you subscribers and listeners. Today, we have Brom from Ally Coffee back on the line. What up, Brom? Hey, Jordan. How's it going? Happy to be back here. Good, man. Good. I'm sipping on my purity coffee. Life is good. There's a fresh blanket of snow outside my back door. Um, you're down in Central America. Why don't you recap, talk about where you're at? Is this weather still nice down there? Well, it's still nice. I'm, I'm based in San Jose in Costa Rica. That's where we have our quality control lab and, and office with Ally Coffee. And it's, uh, it's starting to become summer here, dry season. So it's nice and sunny. Um, I'm very excited for summer to kick off, going to the beach on the weekend. So yeah, the rainy season was long. It took like eight months. So summer here, it's, it's always nice weather here, but summer is especially uh, nice because the rain stops and the sun comes out every single day. Man, I am, listen, when, when it's non-pandemic times, I'm a traveling man. I will go anywhere, anytime. I'm all over the U.S. I try to get out of the U.S. as much as I possibly can. It's been too long. As soon as uh, normalcy returns, I am headed straight south, and we're going to get some coffee. We're going to go to the farms. We're going to check it all out, man. We're going to talk today with Brian yeah. about the farms themselves, about the farmers he works with, about economic stability, about his home coffee growing. Really, really good coffee chat that we're about to have. So uh, thank you for coming on the show, Brahm. Are you ready to dive into today's episode? Anytime. Yeah, I'm ready for it. Let's do it. So we kind of left off on this relationship with the farmers. You know, I'm always kind of, I'm intrigued by the, the depth of the relationship within the production chain, right? Because you're producing this kind of economic product. And usually that just means passing hands based on price and volume and you know, demand and all this stuff. But with coffee, it's different. More and more, there's, there's necessary transparency. More and more, there's, there's a necessity for a real relationship, whether that's between the consumer and the roaster or the roaster and the supplier, the supplier and the farmer. It's just really, really fascinating to me. Um, and I feel like it is a growing trend to have more transparency and better relationships. What can you say across the board, like when uh, you as a, as a supplier, is it a rare thing that you're going to meet the farmers and, and talk to them? Is that, is that the norm? What's the norm? What's extraordinary? And talk to me about the relationship with the coffee farmers themselves. I think the, the norm really differs, you know, from, from type of coffee, uh, between specialty coffee and conventional coffee and all that. But for us here at, at Ada Coffee, our norm is to, to establish our offices in the specialty coffee growing regions, such as here in Costa Rica, we have another office in, in Colombia, in Bogota, in Brazil, and in Addis Ababa, and in Ethiopia. So we really like to be close to the producers um, exactly for the points you mentioned to improve transparency and mostly also to be able to collaborate much more uh, effectively and efficiently with the producers to, to improve the supply chain as a whole. So for us, it's, it's definitely the norm. Um, now that the harvest is coming up, I'm visiting um, a couple of farmers every single week. And just yesterday, I was at a farm um, called La Clandestina Micro Mill from the Duran family. And even though I visit people you know, multiple times per year, for me, it's incredible that every time I visit, you know, there's something new we can talk about, or there's another project we can discuss or look at new opportunities. And that makes those visits so valuable because we create opportunities together um, and, and make a better supply chain and, and increase the collaboration to make the supply chain more, more sustainable, more stable, more consistent. Um, 
in where I figure um, as LA Coffee's buyer, as that connection point between the coffee roasters and the coffee producers and create that stability in the chain. Absolutely. And, and more valuable to me as the consumer. Like I, as a real coffee connoisseur, um, you can you can have not that I'm the coffee connoisseur, but you know you can really as a coffee connoisseur. There's never been a better time. Like what a what an incredible time to be a coffee drinker. Um, that's that's really cool, man. I assume that you had a similar experience that I did when you talked to these farmers. Where for for at least the ones that I spoke to, farming is their life. I mean, it's not just their job and then they clock out. It's these guys live and breathe farming, and they're so passionate about the plants. Do you kind of find that? especially with the specialty guys, I'd imagine, across the board? Yes, definitely. There's, there's no clocking out, um, especially during harvest season, and especially for people who produce and process um, coffee. Um, that was another thought I had yesterday on my visit. You know, we, when I visit farms, we always try to do some on-site work, you know, help, help out a little bit, um, just symbolically, or for me to have a better idea how their processes work and what they do exactly. And just a simple task, like moving the coffee um, on the drying beds. So for, for context for our listeners, um, after coffee has been, been harvested and poked, there's different ways to dry it. But in this example from yesterday, it is dried in very thick layers uh, with a lot of weight, with a lot of uh, mucilage. So it's very, um, it's very heavy but it needs to be turned constantly. So every 30 minutes, every one hour, we need to go to those beds and turn pounds and pounds of coffee around. And it's quite quite hard work. And I did it for, for an hour or two and, and I got quite exhausted. And then I think, well, this is happening, you know, every single day and, and around Costa Rica and around Central America, around the world, millions of people are doing this, this very heavy labor intensive work every single day. And there's no clocking in, there's no clocking out. Coffee has very strict drying times, uh, fermentation times, picking times. So it's not, you know, it's five o'clock, I, I, I go home. Um, you need to you need to adapt yourself to the coffee cycles. Whoa, that's wild. That, that, is a, that is an incredible thought that so much manual labor and such a simple kind of task running the entire economy of these countries and the economy of my cup. Oh, clutch my pearls if the coffee ran out. That's what, that's what Dr. Coffee's always talking about, nightmare scenario. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I do have a question. Maybe in your other work or seeing these commercial farms, have you ever run into any kind of bad players in the farming industry where you're like, wait a second, did you, have you ever stumbled across any practices where I'm sure this has happened and you don't have to get into specifics or anything, but, you know, like nasty pesticide use or just kind of unsavory practices? Yeah, there, there's at times either firsthand experience or or hearing you know hearing the rumors in, in the regions. There's stuff you, you stumble upon that you know you might not agree with or or I should say are unsavory. Um, but instead of you know directly judging people for for what they do, um, if I have an opportunity to talk to people, I, I often will. Sometimes I, I may not have the opportunity to, to directly ask about it. But at the same time, I, I stop and think like what's at the root of these practices, right? Is this because people are inherently bad and want to hurt other people? I, I don't think so. I think it's because the the pressure that may come from supply chain upstream from consumers, from from uh, coffee roasters or other corporations involved in the trade in terms of price or, or other uh, delivery terms of quality, perhaps that's why you know, things, things may be messed up at the farm because the people in charge succumb under the pressure to to produce at a lower cost or produce more coffee at the same cost. And and sooner or later, someone will suffer for that, right? That's a very compassionate and profound thought. You're right. The pressure on the supply chain is a very accurate choice of words. I did want to run by you. You know, I saw this article that Starbucks is supposedly going to, you can start scanning the QR code of your cup at this you know, commercial chain. It'll tell you where it came from. And I guess it's just a kind of, they're just sort of introducing it in a couple locations or whatever. Who knows if it's going to take off, but I feel that's pressure from people like you guys and people like Purity Coffee who, who are like, yeah, you can come down and meet the farmers. Yeah. You can tell the story of the farmers on your website or on the back of your bag. Like, don't you feel that that Starbucks didn't come up with that on their own? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's pressure from you guys, I feel. So I just wanted to kind of point that out and 
give people like you props. Definitely, yeah. I've heard about the, the Starbucks QR codes, um, and I'm I'm glad you know, this is happening. And and if you know companies like Ally or Purdy or, or other people in this segment um, have you know r- raised raised that pressure on Starbucks, then I'm very glad to, to have been part of that, directly or indirectly. I don't know the specifics of the code, and I, I think I actually tried it and was you know relatively unimpressed with the traceability I've I've gotten. <laughs> and it's mostly um, not to not to shit on them completely either or or anything like that. No, please, but, this is a free speech coffee zone. <laughs> so the, the information I found when I did it was you know quite basic. So there are international traceability standards in coffee um, set by the International Coffee Organization, right? In which there is a code which is called the ICO code, which identifies the country, the exporter, and the lot number of a coffee. That that goes in every youth bag by international law. So that's quite an impressive. Like if you show that, that's like, yeah, that's already existent. So I did not find any you no know, how do you say that? Exceptional. Groundbreaking, exceptional, additional <laughs> traceability, right? It was it was rather you no know, um it was just showing their already existing compliance. So what right? you're it's, saying is you as the supplier have that code that says where it comes from and you know a couple of basic information here. Most people just don't put that on their bag. They're literally just adding this thing that's right there already. That's fascinating. We'll never exactly. Um, again, <laughs> disclaimer, I, I don't have all the all the all the information. And I it might be interesting to talk about I do know people who sell to Starbucks, um, for example. Uh, some farms in the solar and they're generally very um, happy with with the treatment they have given um oh and i'm sure they're going to improve it yeah it's not like you know what i mean i'm sure exactly it, but still I, it's funny from an insider perspective we would have we would have never known that um so and i'm like i said i'm sure they're going to build the database if they were smart they would they would take pictures of the farm even if it was just like satellite exactly it, it, it does feel like tricking a consumer uh who may not be as educated about the supply chain or where coffee comes from. Like if you barely know coffee comes from Central America, you might be amazed to see that, oh, wow, this coffee came from, from Nicaragua or, or wherever. Right. But that's really, you know, doing the minimal, uh, but talking a lot about it, right? Interesting. That's a good insight, man. <laughs> um, I wanted to speak on the scalability uh, specifically mm-hmm. specialty and organic coffees because you know I went and what I would I went and saw what I would consider a big farm but I imagine that like in every major production chain like there's levels to the game right is mm-hmm. there is there a limit on the scalability of specialty coffee regenerative coffee in your opinion um yes and no if you talk about specialty regenerative organic coffee Scaling that, that's definitely, definitely very difficult, right? And I think that the way it's being done right now is through the cooperative level, uh, the, through the cooperative method, which if, if executed correctly can be very successful. Um, so uniting several smaller farmers and training them to, to implement specific practices that, that are regenerative, that are organic, and certifying that to capture more value. I think... You know, in theory, that's an amazing model. And I'm very proud to, to have partnered with cooperatives, such as, for example, in Honduras, we work with a cooperative called Comi Cobel, who have done that miraculously, right? Who I visited the farmers, we've done third party verifications of those practices um, outside of just a normal uh, certification and gotten really good results. Of course, always room for improvement, but generally very good results. But at the same time, not all all coffee that is marketed may, may equally um, comply with those standards or exceed them. Now, I wonder where that limit lies. I'm trying to look up the size of Hacienda La Pradera. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's. Um, I thought it would have been La Pradera you visited. I went there too last year, actually. And if I recall, it, it, it might be around 100 hectares, something like that. I'm not sure. Uh, that's that's big to me, but I mean, this is such a huge industry. That's probably a tiny yeah. 
Indeed, it's for an organic farm. It's, it's very big, right? And managing that organically involves so much manual labor, and, and they're a great example as well of, of some really amazing work they do in terms of maintaining that land organically. Uh, but at the same time, you know, there's millions of hectares grown with coffee. Whoa. So, yeah, turning, for example, if you say, like, okay, we want to turn and complete a region to, to regenerative or organic farming, that is a huge task. Right. So scaling, it, it requires, um, it requires really good, maybe even national level, government level, um, yeah. How do you say that? Um, coordination. Zone. Right. Like really, like you need to zone this stuff. And I was speaking to someone on my other podcast about how they're trying to, you know, basically terraform this arid piece of land and how they're going to build rain catches on the way down a hill. You're right. At a certain point, you need cooperation with, with local authorities. Exactly. And I think an interesting example is that there is political parties in the Netherlands, my home country, who are vouching for, to reduce, for example, the our cattle stock in the Netherlands by 50% to, oh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. However, to do that, they would buy out these farmers out of their farms, right? Mm. Or they would subsidize or compensate them to do that. I, I doubt that those types of financial compensation for that work on such a national level is possible in most coffee producing countries. Well, wow. like, that's an like, interesting thought. You can't just do that. There, farmers. Yeah, there, there is no agricultural uh, subsidy in general, you know, in coffee producing countries. So barely not that I know of, not in the way wine producers are subsidized in France or, or corn producers maybe subsidized in the U.S. I, I don't know of any schemes like that in coffee production countries, let alone for organic practices, right? Man, that's a really good point. It's crazy. The, the coffee world seems so fragile, too. Like, they talk about the loss of land. Mm -hmm. You talk to these farmers, like, man, between the rust and the borer beetles and all of this, like, again. It's really, yeah, you're really down, you know, um, you're left to your own resources. It's, it's you and your family and maybe your cooperative structure, but you have to fend for yourself. No one's going to come in and save you or help you or, or do your dirty work. Um, there's no government who subsidizes. There is no international coordination to, to really invest in, in sustainability or, or infrastructure. So it's fending for yourself really um, as a coffee producer. Yeah, it's really wild and, and kind, of, um, kind of a shame how hard these people work and oftentimes how little they get recognized. You know, a lot of these people doing really incredible things, can't afford a certification, can't get a good price for their bean, have a hard time staying in business. It's, it's, um, it's a tough world. Farming is hard enough to begin with, and coffee farming is this whole nother, whole nother world, man, it seems like. Um, I wanted to talk to you about your home coffee plant. I got a mm -hmm. company on the podcast here. You know, we, we sent out these coffee seeds. Some of you sent lovely pictures. I really consider myself to uh, have a green thumb. I love to garden. I could not get either of my coffee seeds to sprout. They never sprouted. And I was so disappointed, a real blow to the ego. And then Brom tells me that he's got a couple of plants that he's cultivating at his, uh, at his little place there in Costa Rica. So I had to ask you, how is that going? Um, do you have a hard time germinating them too? <laughs> Indeed. Um, the, the, it's, a, it's a hobby plantation, I would say it might be in American terms, maybe just an acre. It's about 500 plants of coffee. Whoa! Um, so it's it's a nice little. It's it's not a garden. It's a nice little production. Um, and I really wanted to get the experience for myself, right? So nice. working working with all these farmers and hearing from their from their trouble and and communicating about their trouble to other people as well. Sometimes, like we do right now on the, on the podcast, I wanted to get a much much deeper understanding of the actual agricultural parts of, of coffee production. But I visit very often, but on a day's visit, you you just can't see enough. And coffee has you know, yearly cycles, and every month is different, right? Every month something else is happening to the plant, and I very often only get these snapshots. So I wanted to get a complete picture. Um, so my parents-in-law were happy 
to to lend me some land in front of their house to grow with coffee. So it's aptly named Finca La Suegra, um, which is uh, the mother-in-law farm <laughs> in English. And and here we are with five hundred coffee plants. That's incredible, man. I thought you I thought you were doing a little like front porch type thing. You have five hundred plants, so you wanted to feel the struggles of getting them to grow. You wanted to feel the success of the harvest, maybe feel the pain of a, of an infestation. You just want to get deeper into the mind of a farmer. That's incredible. Exactly. Yeah. Feel the pain and, and feel the hard work and, and see what it really takes to produce coffee. Um, we planted it about one and a half years ago now. And, and we just picked the first cherries. They just finished drying. So I'm very excited to, to taste them very soon, but we've had um, all types of infestation, all types of trouble, already um and i've been very gladly assisted by many of the coffee farmers i work with uh with their with their knowledge and their inputs and actually don carlos montero from donnelly uh, micro miller in costa rica he helped me get the plants and, and came down here to to teach me how to plant coffee because it's not just putting it in the ground and hoping for it to to come out as you've seen there's a there's a lot of uh, methodology to that as well Man, yeah, I really struggle, unfortunately, with my with my two green beans. So there were actually some people who were going to get in on the second um, germination. We want to make sure that we get some really robust coffee seeds before we send them out to our listeners again, because I want this thing to pop, figure out some uh, better maybe climate issues. I do know it's really cool where I'm trying to uh, sprout them. So yeah, I was just a little disappointed. I'll be honest with you, audience members. But uh but Brom, I, I gotta see your what you got going on. You should shoot me some pictures when the show's over, man. I gotta see that. I will. I definitely will. I'll, I'll go out in a second and send you some pictures. It's it's going well. Um, my first germination didn't work as well. Uh, this, this was the second time. I got a disclaimer. I bought the plants already big. Most of the plants I planted, they, they were already germinated and ready to be planted. Um, and I've germinated some seeds myself as well. Um, but yeah, we're trying to farm as organic as, as possible, um, which I have not been successful in. Unfortunately, the, it's very humid zone, so the amount of coffee depressed and, and other fungi um, were about to obliterate my plantation. So so I did resort to, to chemical fungicides as well at some point when my, my organic efforts did not uh, surface, unfortunately. So it's hard. It's, um, it's the last resort, but you got to... In the end, you know, I'm I'm not financially dependable on this coffee at all. It's a hobby, but in the end, you got to resort to to what keeps you afloat, right? What works, and you're also still deep, more deeply understanding the farmer. And I also mm-hmm. think that it's probably a shame because, again, I was just talking to someone on my other show who's trying to translate a lot of uh, regenerative organic stuff into Spanish. Um, but what I was trying to get at here is, here in America, we've got a lot of different really smart people working on an an array of natural combatants and products and non-chemical fungicides, non-chemical pesticides, enzyme products, fungi products, microbial applications. And I doubt that that's as available in somewhere like Costa Rica. Am I wrong about that? I mean, we have, we have a wide array now. There seems to be more every day. Yeah. You'd be surprised. Um, There, there's a lot of knowledge here, but it's, it's, it has gotten lost a little bit because the, the, the synthetic products have shown to be much more effective. But, you know, the, the odd farmer we work with, we find, um, does make this own, uh, we call microorganisms, for example. So we produce microorganisms um, that are available at the farm to, to combat it. Fungi, that's something I did as well. We, we collected, uh, you know, leaves that are rotting for example and you mix them with with molasses and with uh with rice husk and you can reproduce for example microorganisms yeah that makes sense um, here here on the show we have a regenerative organic specialist mary beth sanchez and she for instance works with a company called dr zymes eliminator and this is an end en- mm-hmm. proprietary secret enzyme blend and it's just like that's the first thing that pops to my head it's an incredible product i should hook you up with mary beth brahm you two would hit it off but definitely, I just I just wish that there was um, more of these companies, even more than there are, and I wish that they were more international because I know many of them don't even ship to Canada, let alone you know far overseas. But anyways, man, yeah, 
it's tough. Exactly. Yeah, no, it's not available to purchase as, for example, as a um, replacement for the synthetic options. That's why organic farming is so more expensive. Um, in organic farming, you have to make all the products you use. So as you said, it's not widely available here to just go out and purchase um, those fertilizers. You may be able to purchase like an organic fertilizer, like compost. But those more technological products to fight specific fungi or specific uh, other pests, you need to make them yourself. So first of all, you need to know how to make them. And second of all, it's very labor in intensive to make them. For example, the Silucho Conejo in Honduras, the organic Demeter certified farm we buy from for Purity, they have up to 25 different recipes for different types of pests, for different types of humidity levels. And they all make them by hand. And making them by hand to give an idea, you need to, to usually get a fire started, um, uh, wood fire, um, heat a barrel 200 liters or 40 gallons of, um, of water and have someone, you know, watch that, watch that water boil, make sure it's safe, and then prepare those products to, to be later applied to the coffee. Opposed to if you buy it from the local supplier synthetically, just go and you buy it and you're done. Yeah. And it's not like those those organic products may, may not even be more cheap than synthetic ones. Usually the synthetic products are cheaper than the organic ones. So you need to spend more money on the ingredients and then spend labor on making them and then spend the same amount of labor on applying them. And you usually need to apply it in much larger quantities than the synthetic ones because synthetic ones are much more concentrated. So it's just much more expensive and labor intensive to produce coffee organically. That's true. And, um, if, and if these products that I talk about are available, you probably wouldn't even want to use them on a large scale because you're paying for that labor on their end. Like it is, it is still more effective to make your own, even though that appears to be more costly than just the quote traditional synthetic farming route. Exactly. You know, if you, if you make it on a small scale, you know, a home style, you know, it, it, it may, it may break even, but as we were talking about scalability earlier, if you have a larger farm or, or want to do this for multiple people, then, you know, you, you hit a wall sooner or later, unfortunately. Yeah, that's true. Nothing, nothing's better than the home application of composting and making your own input. That's really like where it shines. And, and that's, that's also why it's so impressive when people do pull it off on a large scale. So, so yeah, man. That's exactly. Yeah. Let us know, keep us up to date on your garden, obviously on your, your 500 plant garden. <laughs> I will, and I'm, I'm hoping to get a good harvest next year and be able to, to export some coffee as well, a couple of kilos at least. Um, we'd love to have you back on, man. We still haven't talked much about Netherlands coffee culture. We haven't talked much about a lot of things I want to talk to you about, economic stability, uh, trade aspects. We'll get back into it on the next episode. Brom, why don't you uh, throw out your plugs? Where can people find Ally? Where can people find you? Thanks, Jordan. Yeah, people can find Ally at, at allycoffee.com. Yeah, there you can find a lot of information about the different farms we work about. We have a blog. Uh, we have a lot of resources available there as well. And personally, I'm on Instagram as Bram underscore the Um There you can get me a follow and keep up to date with my work, uh, my life, and my, my little coffee farm here. Appreciate you, buddy. Can't wait to speak to you again. Thank you so much. Thank you, listeners. Stay tuned. We'll be back soon. Appreciate you all. This is Jordan River and Bram from Ally Coffee signing off saying, have an extraordinary day out there, everybody. We'll see you next time on the Coffee Health and Science Podcast. Bye.